Hello everyone, welcome to this webinar on arthritis and sleep. My name's Bree, I'm the Health Promotion Coordinator at Arthritis Queensland and today we'll be focusing on the complex relationship between arthritis and sleep and we're going to um, spend some time exploring common sleep issues in people with arthritis and practical strategies to improve sleep quality. So this, as always, it's a, um, this presentation is general and it does contain general information and advice. And we've done everything we can to make sure it's accurate and reliable, but it's not a substitute for the individual treatment advice from your doctor or your rheumatologist. And while it's on sleep, you know, if you see sleep specialist, it's not, um, don't use this instead, of, like take on their advice. So always chat with your doctor specialist um, or any other healthcare provider to get that specific individual medical treatment or advice. So in spirit of reconciliation, Arthritis Queensland and New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So today we'll be covering a few different topics where we'll be discussing the importance of sleep and this will include the complex relationship between arthritis and sleep. Then we're going to have a look at the science of sleep and what that actually means and how sleeping, arthritis and chronic pain are all interconnected. Then we're going to finish off the um, webinar with some sleep hygiene tips. All right, so first quiz question, I'm going to get the quiz up. Um, so as I mentioned, it is anonymous, so I don't actually see who selects what answer. Um, all right, but just select the one that you think is correct. Okay, so do you think sleep is important because it allows our body to burn extra calories? or if it helps us feel refreshed and restored. If you think it is vital for human and mammal survival, or do you think it increases the production of body hair? I can see some answers coming in. Okay, thanks everyone. So I think everyone has submitted. All right, let's, so it, this is a little bit of a tricky one. It is the third one. So it is vital for human and mammal survival. So that is why sleep is so important, but it definitely does make us feel refreshed and restored. So that was a little bit of a tricky question, but the most important part of sleep is that it is vi vital for our survival. All right. Met somebody now. So, as mentioned, sleep is vital for mammal and human survival, and it's really, it's really just as important as what water is for us, as what food is for us, and oxygen. So, all of these key things—water, food, oxygen, and sleep—is really, really vital for our well-being, and it also plays a really critical role in so many different. Body, bodily functions. So sleep is really beneficial for our physical health as it aids in the repair and recovery where it facilitates cell and tissue repair and it supports growth and immune function. So it really is that repair and restore of all our cells um, makes our immune system strong and function correctly. And it also helps us fight off illnesses and recover from injuries because it has that cell and tissue repair. Sleep is really crucial for our overall well-being as it improves our heart health and weight management, as well as promoting mental refreshment and recovery from fatigue. Sleep also enhances our memory and cognitive function it's really important for our brain health and supports processes like our memory, our learning and our problem solving. It also helps maintain attention, creativity and decision-making abilities. 
Sleep also regulates our emotions and it improves our mood stability. And as we know, sleep can have such a huge effect on our mood and our overall emotional well-being. So when we don't actually get enough sleep, we we can definitely feel feel um, irritable. We can have increased levels of anxiety and depression as well. Sleep also balances our hormones, and these hormones are and especially seen in hormones that regulate our metabolism, our appetite, our sleep, and also the hormones that regulate our blood sugar levels and our blood pressure and then sleep deprivation. So when we don't get enough sleep, it really disrupts our mood, our appetite and hormone balance. And it actually increases the risk of developing some chronic diseases. And we'll go into a little bit more detail of that later on. All right, our next quiz question. Let me get this one up. So how much sleep do we need? Um, And let's put this one in watch okay how much sleep do we need do you think and so firstly sorry there's two correct answers so you can choose two different answers here um so do you think we need six to seven hours of sleep do you think we need five to seven hours sleep or seven to nine hours or seven to eight so select two answers in this one So the answers are coming in, which is great. A few different answers. All right. I think that might be everyone. All right. So what we actually need and what's optimal for our health is um, seven to nine hours and seven to eight hours sleep. So answer number three and four are correct in this one, and we'll go into detail why that is. So sleep, it varies among everyone. So some people may require a lot more sleep than others, and then other people can, you know, do life on a couple of hours of sleep. So they do require a lot less than others. So the standard guidelines suggest Um, Between the ages of 26 and 64 years of age, you should be aiming for seven to nine hours of sleep for that optimal health and well-being. But what can also be appropriate is getting six hours or 10 hours of sleep. So I know for myself, I definitely function best of nine to 10 hours of sleep. So I'm one of those people that need lots of sleep. And then my, um, if I have anything less than that, I'm a bit like a zombie and I find it really hard to concentrate. And then my husband, he actually can like functions best of six to seven hours sleep. So he's at that other end where I'm at the higher end. And then if you're over the age of 65, it's recommended anything um, between seven to eight hours of sleep is optimal for you but five to six hours or nine hours may be appropriate. And the reason why people over 65 years of age typically have a lower amount of recommended sleep time compared to younger adults, it's due to several different um, physiological and lifestyle changes that occur with aging. So I just got to let these people in. Um, So some of these changes include um, changes in our sleep rhythm. So we met, um, when you're over the age of 65, you might have lighter sleeping and you might wake up a lot more frequently during the night. You actually may have reduced melatonin production. So that's our sleepy hormone. So that comes in at night to promote us to go to sleep. And then we might have changes in our circadian rhythm, which is our body clock. And then over the age of 65, you might be taking medications or you you can take medications at any age, but you might be taking more medications um, and they can have an impact on your sleep quality. And then then, um, there could be other lifestyle factors as well. So many people can really underestimate their need for sleep. 
but long-term health benefits often require more than what is actually perceived. So it's really important that we get the quality of sleep as it's really like good quality sleep is really essential for rejuvenation and restoration and it contributes to our overall health and well-being. So circadian rhythm. So I mentioned this in the previous um, slide and it's an natural internal process and it regulates our sleep wake cycle and it repeats roughly every 24 hours and this is referred to as the body clock so the circadian rhythm plays a really crucial role in determining our sleep patterns and other physiological processes so our body operates on an internal clock um, which regulates all our processes and behaviours, and that includes our sleep. So some of our core functions are controlled by, you know, the circadian rhythm, so our body clock, and this includes our core temperature, our hormone production, our eating habits, you know, digestion, um, alertness, sleepiness, our sleep timing and performance. So a lot of core functions rely on this body clock. So our circadian rhythm is also synchronized to a 24-hour sleep cycle and it aligns in our internal processes with external factors like the day-night cycle and social cues. So the primary bi biological clock that controls the circadian rhythm is located in the I'm going to have a try at saying this, so bear with me, um, suprachiasmatic nucleus, but I'm going to refer to it as the SCN. So our circadian rhythm is located in this SCN, and that's actually found in the hypothalamus of the brain. So the SCN direct, um, receives direct input from our eyes, and it responds to changes in from being light to darkness but also is quite responsive to subtle cues like exercise, um, meal times, and social activities. So in the morning, exposure to daylight, it actually signals the SCN to promote, hey, it's time to wake up and be alert. So, And then in the evening, the absence of light prompts the SCN to start the production of melatonin. So at night, we've got no light in front of us. So our SEN's like, let's um, start the melatonin production. And that melatonin, which is our sleepy hormone, it actually promotes sleep. So we start to feel really tired and start to get into that sleep cycle. So our body clock also helps anticipate optimal times for sleep. Um, wakefulness, meals, activity, and social interaction. It also collaborates with the sleep cycle to regulate natural patterns of sleep and wakefulness as well. So typically people feel most alert in the morning and in early afternoon. Um, then there's a, typically people experience that dip in alertness in the mid afternoon. So, you know, that, um, 3 p.m., 4 p.m., where they start to feel a bit tired. And then um, this also helps us feel sleepy in the evening as well. All right, the sleep sages. So sleep is a really complex process and it does involve multiple stages, each with a distinct physiological and neurological characteristic. I'm just going to put my little laser pointer on so you can see that. So these five stages, two, three, four, five, they're actually divided into two different types. So you've got your non-REM sleep, so stage one, stage two, stage three or four, a non-REM, and then you have, which stands for, sorry, non-rapid eye movement, and then you've got your REM, which is rapid eye movement, so that's stage five. So both of these stages and all five stages um, are really, really vital for healthy rest. All right, so stage one, so non-REM sleep, this is the lightest stage of sleep and it lasts only a few minutes as you transition from being awake to sleep 
and you can be in this stage for one to seven minutes. So our brain activity begins to really slow down. Our heartbeat slows down as, as well, as well as our breathing starts to decrease. So our muscles start to relax in this stage and that's when you occasionally have that muscle twitch. So if you know your, I know my husband, as he starts to fall asleep, he twitches a lot and that's that stage one non-REM sleep. So in this stage, um, our brain produces theta waves. So these are a type of a electrical pulse that our brain produces when we're lightly sleeping or when we're dreaming and it's the dominant frequency in our healing and high creative states. So the purpose of stage one is to initiate the sleep process and prepare our body for the deeper sleep stages. And then we go to stage two. So stage one it lasts for about one to seven minutes and then we transition into stage two. So this is a deeper sleep compared to stage one, but it's still classified as a light sleep. So this stage may last 10 to 20 minutes. And in this stage, we have reduced awareness. Our body temperature starts to drop. Our heart rate slows down even more. And then our eye movements cease. So our brain waves continue to slow down and we still have that occasional burst of rapid brain wave activity. So this is called sleep spindles and K complexes. So the purpose of this stage is to consolidate and process the day's experiences and it helps our body get into um, that further relaxation. Then we move on to stage three and four. So it's still a non-REM sleep, but um, this is also called a slow wave sleep and it's the beginning of our really, really deep sleep stage so we can be in this stage for 20 to 40 minutes um, and you may as I mentioned you may heard be people may refer to it as the slow wave sleep or the delta sleep so what this means is that it's marked by slowed brain wave activity and it's really really difficult to physically wake somebody up when they're in stage three and four and if you do wake them, they can be really disorientated and not really know what's going on. So the purpose of this stage is to restore and repair the body. It supports our immune function and it promotes physical growth and development. So it's our real like repair and re recovery stage. And that's why it's really important to get into the deep sleep and be in stage three and four. And then after the stage three and four, we move into REM sleep. So this is our rapid eye movement stage. And this stage, we have increased brain activity. And this is where we do the, like lots of vivid dreaming. So this stage, we can be in it for 10 to 60 minutes long. And despite the high brain activity, our body actually experiences that um, temporary paralysis. Um, and the reason why it does this is to prevent us from acting out our dreams. So when we're in this REM sleep stage, we're really quite close to consciousness and it can be really easy to wake someone during the REM sleep compared to the deep non-REM sleep. And when we're in the REM sleep, we're more likely to remember our dreams as well. So this five stages this complete sleep cycle it can last from anything from 90 to 120 minutes and we will keep repeating these stages all throughout the night and as our sleep cycle shortens we have REM sleep dominating so both the non-REM and the REM sleep are really crucial for our biology um, our learning and our memory and it also helps us with our emotional processing and problem solving skills so it really shows how important it is to get the seven to nine hours of sleep per night all right so now the sleep cycles and what that actually looks like during the night so during a typical seven to nine hour sleep period 
we'll go through about four or five different sleep cycles. So going from um, stage one to stage five, four to five times each night. So this can, as I mentioned, it can last anything from 90 to 120 minutes. So these cycles include different stages of sleep. So they range from like the light sleep right down to the um, deepest of sleep stages here. And some people, the sleep patterns can be really quite predictable, while for others, it can be a lot more sporadic. And that's actually seen across, that's especially seen across all the different age groups. So in this picture, we see the varying depths of sleep in that up and down, so down and up motion. Initially, we transition from being awake to the non REM sleep, so stage one, and that happens with um, and takes a couple of minutes and then we're in that stage for about seven to ten minutes long. Then we drop down to sleep, um, sleep stage two, which is still a light sleep, but it's deeper than stage one. And we can be in that for about 10 to 20 minutes as we go down to sleep stage three and sleep stage four, which is our deepest of sleep stages. So we're in these stage three and stage four for about um, 20 to 40 minutes. And we start to increase again until we hit stage five, which is our REM sleep. And we can be in that one from 10 to 60 minutes. And then we go through the cycles all again. So this picture represents an older person's sleep cycle because it shows a dominance in REM sleep. So as you get older, you start to go more and more into the REM sleep stages and less into the deeper sleep stages. And it's common for older people to spend less time in that deep sleep stage as they age. And that's typically why a lot of people, as you get older, you start to go, why don't I feel refreshed and restored? Because you're spending less time in that deep sleep stage, which gives us that feeling of being refreshed and restored. All right, core body temperature. So this actually plays a really significant role in regulating our circadian rhythm, which in turn influences our sleep-wake cycle. So typically our lowest body core temperature. So this is seen in the red line here. This um, occurs around the 3 and 4 a.m. mark. Um, and then the highest point is typically seen in um, during the day and early evening. So this rhythm mirrors our sleep cycle pattern. And that dip in core body temperature that we see at um, night, so here it helps us promote to fall asleep. Um, and it helps the onset and maintenance of sleep as well. And it helps us reach, so when our uh, core body temperature decreases, it makes us reach that deeper sleep stages, so sleep stage three and stage four. But when we have high body temperature, we tend to feel more alert and awake. And this can explain why it's diffi often difficult to fall asleep during those hot summer nights. So the interactions highlight the intricate connection between body temperature and circadian rhythm and the sleep cycle, which are all biological processes. And we're gonna go into more detail about how melatonin and cortisol can also play a role in our um, sleep cycle. So the cortisol and melatonin relationship. So cortisol here is the red line. Um, and it's often referred to as our stress hormone. So this follows a daily rhythm. So it peaks in the morning when we wake up. See how it's highest here in the morning when we wake up? And then it gradually decreases throughout the day. So this pattern promotes wakefulness. And if we have chronically elevated cortisol levels, so if they stayed up the entire time and didn't really decrease much, this is when it can be linked to chronic inflammation. When cortisol is properly regulated, it does have an anti-inflammatory property. Um, it, when it's regulated properly, like this line here, when it goes down, it's supposed to peak in the morning and go down, 
Um, it can help suppress pain receptors and um, reduce pain signals. So it can raise the pain threshold and make people less sensitive to painful stimuli, including joint pain. So that's when it's working correctly. Melatonin, which is this black line here, so that's our sleepy hormone, so the hormone responsible that helps us promote sleep and fall asleep. Um, it is produced in response to darkness and it actually helps lower our core body temperature. So if you see in this other slide, so I'll just get, go back, see here melatonin's the blue line. When it peaks at night, when we're supposed to, it starts to get elevated when we go to sleep, so when it peaks in the middle of the night, that's where our core body temperature has decreased. So it helps lower our body temperature, which helps us go into that deep stage three and four sleep patterns. So melatonin, um, where was I? So it helps lower our body core temperature and the melatonin receptors in our nervous system suggest its role in modulating our pain perception. Um, so the is some limited evidence around that melatonin supplementation may help with pain relief, especially if you suffer from migraines or neuropathic pain. But there's actually quite a, like stronger evidence out there suggesting that it can improve your sleep um, and help reduce pain perception if you take um, the supplementation, melatonin supplementation. So the link between reduced sleep and increased pain is significant. Because people with arthritis, you often feel like the pain is worse at night time. So what this means with the relationship between cortisol, cortisol and melatonin for people with arthritis. So if you have an imbalance, so if they don't follow this typical pattern, um, if you have an imbalance in it, um, it can explain why people with um, arthritis may experience increased pain in the morning. So for example, low cortisol levels in the morning. So here it's high, that's great. But if you have really low cortisol levels when you wake up, it can lead to um, pain. So you're not having that um, pain relief that it produces. And if your melatonin levels don't drop when you wake up, so if they're super high in melatonin, the sleepy hormone, if that's high when you wake up, you feel really tired and therefore it can actually increase your pain sensitivity. So melatonin high when you wake up, cortisol low, that's the imbalance. It can actually lead to more pain that you're experiencing and feeling. With morning pain and stiffness, so Cortisol is lower in the morning, melatonin is, is high or not, not balanced properly. People um, you know, with, for example, rheumatoid arthritis may experience more pain and stiffness in the morning. And it can this imbalance can be seen all during the day and it can explain why you feel more pain at certain times of the day because they're not imbalanced, because they're imbalanced, they're not regulating as they normally should. So understanding the cortisol and melatonin relationship can actually really help manage arthritis pain um, and it considers factors that affect these hormone levels such as sleep patterns, stress management and even the, um, and even the medication timing can impact this relationship as well. So this image, just a little summary, it highlights how the daily Natural daily fluctuations of cortisol and melatonin um, when out of balance can contribute to the morning pain experienced by people with arthritis. So proper management of sleep and stress um, under the guidance of your doctor or specialist can help mitigate some of these effects. All right, so sleep cycle factors. So our circadian rhythm and sleep cycle is influenced by diff all these different factors. So the first one, napping. So napping can impact your circadian rhythm and it's advisable to limit naps to no longer than 90 minutes to avoid disrupting your sleep-wake cycle. Alcohol consumption can also impact your sleep quality. So some people can wake up like multiple times a night um, if they're 
drunk alcohol that day and they can find it really hard to fall back asleep. So they're spending less and less time in that deep sleep stage and not getting that restored feeling. So the blue light that emits from your electronic devices, so your mobile phones, your televisions, your iPads, any of that artificial light, can also disrupt your biological circadian system. Lead, and this can lead to sleep loss and may also contribute to developing sleep disorders like insomnia or circadian rhythm disorders. So the blue light actually suppresses our melatonin release. So it stops the melatonin from being released at night to um, that helps us fall asleep. Um, and it can make it really, really hard to fall asleep and stay asleep, which affects our non-REM sleep stages then you've got our sleep disorders so sleep apnea or restless leg syndrome so these can um, impact our sleep quality as well so sleep apnea um, so that causes repeated pausing in our breathing during sleep and this leads to fragmented sleep and reduced oxygen levels which can lead us feeling tired and unrested even after a full night's sleep and then restless leg syndrome involves that uncontrollable urge to move your legs. And it's often accompanied by uncomfortable sensations um, felt at nighttime. So this constant moving can make it really difficult to fall asleep or stay asleep, which can lead to poor sleep quality, quality and then being really, really fatigued during the day. And then pain, you know, especially arthritis pain can make it hard to fall asleep. And that's especially seen if you're feeling really, really uncomfortable in bed at night. Some people also wake up when they try to move positions because you, where they've got arthritis in those joints can be really painful and it'll wake you up every time you try and move. So these factors can contribute to sleep, reduced sleep quality as well. And then your medications that you take um, can impact the quality of sleep, but we've got a slide dedicated to this. So we'll go into more detail about that. And then drinking high caffeinated drinks like coffee, soft drinks, energy drinks, or eating, you know, chocolate or high sugary foods can also impact our sleep. And especially if you're consuming them late afternoon or at nighttime. And then the outside temperature can impact our sleep. So as mentioned with our core body temperature, if it's really hot and you're really hot, it does, it reduces. Um, so we find it harder to fall asleep. Not getting enough sunlight in the morning can impact your sleep. And that is when we we're talking about this SCN. So as we've already mentioned it, the morning sunlight helps signal that part of your brain that it's time to be awake. It boosts our alertness and it sets the timing for our melatonin production. Without getting enough morning sunlight, our body may struggle to regulate that melatonin, which can make it harder to fall asleep at night and then lead to poorer sleep quality. And then finally, our age. So as we get older, it's harder to maintain good quality sleep. And we're going to touch on all the different factors that happen as we age um, later in the webinar as well. So all of these disruptors interfere with our natural production, production of hormones, which can affect our sleep quality. So distinguishing between sleep disorders, lifestyle factors, um, and these external factors as well is really quite crucial in addressing sleep disturbances and having a bit more of an understanding of these barriers um, of why you're not getting enough sleep or you're finding it really difficult to fall asleep and obviously help you find solutions to improve your sleep quality. All right, napping and sleep pressure. I might just put my laser back on for this one. So napping and sleep pressure, they're really quite closely linked to our body's natural sleep-wake cycle. And it's driven by two key processes. So we've got the homeostatic sleep drive here. And then we have the um, circadian alerting signal, S 
CN. So the homeostatic sleep drive, so this is also known as sleep pressure. Um, it builds up the longer we stay awake. So here we are, we'll wake up at 9 a.m. So then our sleep pressure starts to build during the night. And this creates a stronger need for sleep as the day progresses. So the sleep pressure is obviously highest at night. So see, it's fall asleep here. It's the highest point. Um, and that helps us make us feel sleepy and ready for bed. And then when we start to fall asleep, the sleep pressure decreases over the night and it just keeps doing that same pattern. However, if we nap during the day, this can actually temporarily relieve that sleep pressure. So if you have a 3 p.m. nap, that will reset the sleep pressure and it will start to have to build again. So that's why if you sleep during the day, you might fall asleep a lot later at night because that sleep pressure hasn't hit its peak. And people definitely have struggled for back asleep if they've had you know a really long nap during the day and then on the other hand we have the circadian alerting signal so this is governed by our in, um, internal body clock so our circadian rhythm and it helps us keep awake during the day so it actually counteracts this sleep pressure so this signal typically peaks in the late afternoon um, and early evening and it gives us that natural boost in alertness even if we've been awake for many hours so together the sleep cycle and the circadian alerting signal help um, regulate our sleep patterns and understanding them can help us manage sleep related issues like insomnia or the effects of ship work all right so age-related sleep changes so increased daytime napping is common in older, in older ages due to changes in sleep architecture and increased fragmentation of nighttime sleep. So sleep latency, what that means is that it's the time it takes to fall asleep also may increase with age. So um, as you get older, you might have that increased sleep latency, so it may mean that you it takes longer for you to fall asleep so older adults also experience more frequent awakenings during the night and this could be due to hormonal changes um, your medication that you take uh, certain medi medical conditions if you're in pain or you have some discomfort and um, the reduced amount of time to hit the stage three and four of our deep sleep stages so there is that decrease in the non-REM stage three and non-REM stage four. Um, so that means we're not getting enough deep sleep and we spend more time in that REM sleep and in that stage one non-REM sleep. So the lighter sleep stages increase and the deep sleep, deep sleep stages decrease. So that leads to less restorative sleep so we're waking up not feeling restored and refreshed sleep efficiency decreases with age so that means a higher proportion of time spent in bed is awake and older adults experience more frequent stage shifts during the sleep so this contributes to sleep fragmentation and awakenings so the number of complete sleep cycles during the night might also decrease with age. So this impacts the overall structure of sleep. Um, some older adults experience a reduction in melatonin as well, which affects the timing and quality of sleep and also the ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. So overall, um, getting older, so as we age, it can make it really hard to fall asleep. We have reduced deep sleep stages and we experience more REM sleep. So we wake up not feeling restored or refreshed. And we also become a lot more sensitive to hormonal and environmental changes, which affect our body clock and sleep cycle. And some common sleep issues as we get older. So pain can really significantly impact sleep in so many different ways. 
It can make finding a comfortable sleep position challenging and it can delay the onset of sleep as well. So for, for instance, people with hip or knee or spine osteoarthritis or arthritis in general, like inflammatory forms of arthritis affecting those types of joints, may experience pain when lying in certain positions, which can limit our mobility and cause discomfort as well. So this discomfort can lead to frequently waking up during the night as you may change positions and wake up due to that pain. So these frequent interruptions can prevent you from reaching the deep sleep, so stage three and four, and that impacts our overall sleep quality and restoration. And then you have conditions like insomnia, nighttime pain. Um, if you go wake up and go to the toilet a lot, so frequent urination. Um, if you fall asleep a lot during the day, if you have sleep apnea or restless leg syndrome, this can further compound um, the issues of going to sleep and making it really, really difficult to get a good night quality sleep. So as many of you all know, living with arthritis can really impact your sleep quality and many struggle to get enough high quality sleep. So studies show that approximately 80% of people with rheumatoid arthritis experience sleep difficulties, including issues with onset and latency, and that actually leads to increased pain the next day. Patients with knee or hip osteoarthritis are three times more likely to experience sleep problems as well. I'll just get my little laser pointer on. So in this graph, so arthritis here, it's seen in this first column. So in the graph, you can see that people with um, osteoarthritis are common, also commonly experience sleep problems. So in this study, 25% of people with osteoarthritis experienced um, developed insomnia. And then there was 11 to 12% that had excessive daytime napping. And then 8% um, slept less than six hours a night, every night. So you can imagine that you're not feeling restored and refreshed on less than six hours of sleep. So all of these factors can potentially lead to reduced sleep stages. And it's a really, it's a catch-22 situation. Arthritis can make it difficult to go to sleep. And then sleep deprivation can worsen your arthritis pain. So insomnia can activate parts of the brain sensitive to pain and also suppress areas responsible with coping with pain and can actually, actually worsen your pain perception. So people with arthritis and living in a lot of pain should be assessed for sleep quality issues and then hopefully receiving the correct treatment to improve your sleep which can help manage your pain effectively. So here are some common things that we hear from people um, who contact us, you know, through the Infoline or website or anything like that. And these are just some quotes that we have collected. So the first person said, sometimes my arthritis is worse at night and at night times and I can't sleep. And the next one said, I have osteoarthritis in my knees and my hip and it's worse at night. I can't get comfortable in bed and I wake up several times. It's hard to fall asleep because of the pain. And then the next one was, my, why does my arthritis get worse at night time? And my arthritis has been ruining my sleep. Why is this? And I bet a lot of you often have the same feelings as well as these people. And we're going to go into more detail about why this is. So why does arthritis increase pain at nighttime? So as we've mentioned in quite a bit of detail in the earlier slides, cortisol, so our stress hormone. So as we know, this decreases at night and increases in the morning. So when we have lower levels of cortisol, um, it may lead to elevated inflammation, increased pain, and it's especially seen in joints affected by arthritis. So if your cortisol is out of balance, it really does affect your perception of pain as well. Um, 
Also, if you're sleeping in one position, it can cause your joints to stiffen, leading to premature awakenings and disrupt disrupting your sleep cycle. So the lack of movement during the night can worsen your joint stiffness, causing discomfort and pain when changing positions. So when we don't move a joint, the synovial fluid is not being pumped into it and this fluid acts as a lubricant and a shock absorber. So this is essential for maintaining healthy joint function. So movement helps to distribute this so, some, this synovial fluid throughout your joint, which helps reduce friction and um, between the cartilage surfaces and it, it improves your joint mobility. So that's why healthcare professionals suggest exercise and stretching and moving your joints as it promotes the flow of so, synovial fluid. So when we are sleeping, there's no movement to distribute the fluid, which can cause that stiffness and pain when you wake up. So our pain threshold. So this may also be lower at night as well, and this may contribute to an increased perception of pain. So during the day, distractions such as engaging activities or if you socialize a lot during the day or if you read or participate in a hobby, um, or any interactions with others, this can actually lessen the perception of pain because you are distracted. However, at night, when we don't have those distractions around us and we're in a quiet environment, some people become a lot more aware of their pain, even if it's at the same level as what it was during the day. And then we be can become fixated on that discomfort. So we're in bed, there's no distractions and we're just thinking, oh, wow, my knee hurts, my hip hurts and we fixate on it and you just continually think about it and that can actually heighten the, the awareness as well. So sleep pain and inflammation and arthritis are all interconnected and it does influence each other in different complex ways. All right, so how does sleep deficiency affect you? So it actually has a profound effect on your physical and mental health. So just if you have two nights of sleep and they're only for four hours long, it can actually disrupt our body's hormonal balance. And this particularly affects our appetite regulating hormones. So one appetite hormone known as leptin this signals satiety. So it, it creates that feeling of being full. So when we haven't got enough sleep, leptin, so the full hormone feeling full, it actually decreases by 18%. While ghrelin, um, which is a different appetite hormone, this makes us feel hungry. It stimulates hunger and it increases by 28%. So we've had not enough sleep, four hours sleep for two nights. Our feeling full hormone decreases by 18%, while our hormone that makes us hungry increases by 28%. So we're already set up for consuming probably too much food during the day. So this hormonal imbalance leads to that increased hunger and a stronger craving for those calorie dense foods. So those foods, particularly with you know high sugar, high fat, high carbohydrates, and these factors can lead to weight gain and create a you know a really negative cycle of craving those unhealthy foods. And also on top of all of this, sleep deprivation impairs our glucose tolerance. So it can increase the risk of developing insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So these changes not only promote weight gain, but can also con contribute to metabolic disorders. So beyond appetite and metabolism, chronic sleep deficiency can impair our cognitive function, our mood and our overall well-being. So it really just highlights the critical importance of getting enough sleep to maintain our health. So sleep and pain and the relationship between them. So they're actually really intricately um, linked and they share similar pathways and neurotransmitters in the body. So this connection influences mood, 
pain signaling and natural pain relief and energy levels. So when we don't get enough sleep, our sensitivity to pain is heightened. And this is a condition known as hyperglasia. So this means, um, so essentially sleep deficiency can make even minor aches and pains feel a lot more intense. So our bodies produce endorphins, which act as a natural painkiller, and it helps promote relaxation, which can help us fall asleep. Another important neurotransmitter is serotonin, which is our happy hormone. So serotonin regulates our mood, our sleep, and how we perceive pain. So when serotonin levels are low, it can lead to sleep disturbances and increase our sensitivity to pain. And then cortisol, known as our stress hormone, it also plays a really significant role in this relationship as well. It influences our energy levels and sleep quality. So as mentioned before, when our cortisol levels are imbalanced, it can disrupt sleep and increase pain sensitivity. And this is particularly relevant for people with arthritis who, who often struggle with sleep issues and has worse pain um, that can and struggle with sleep issues, which worsens our pain and negatively impacts our overall health. So sleep deprivation affects pain through different pathways and it depends on the condition and type of sleep deprivation we're having. It can alter our pain thresholds and disrupt, disrupt pain inhibition in the brain, making pain management even more challenging. So understanding this complex relationship highlights the importance of good sleep hygiene and effective pain management management strategies to improve overall well-being. All right, so the impact of medications on sleep and pain. So medications such as NSAIDs, so our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, our SEDs, which is steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, opioids and antidepressants can actually have a significant effect on both sleep and pain management. While these medications effectively reduce pain and inflammation, they may also interfere with deep restorative sleep. So NSAIDs, for instance, so our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they can suppress melatonin production, so our sleepy hormone, um, and change our core body temperature, which can make it harder to fall asleep or achieve that deep non-REM sleep stages. And then opioids, opioids, which is um, our potent pain reliever medications, these cause changes in our central nervous system and brain, and they can actually increase sensitivity to pain over time, which can potentially worsen sleep quality. Antidepressants, which are increasingly used to treat chronic pain and insomnia, can have varied effects on sleep. So they can act on neurotransmitters and pathways involved in pain signaling or um, reduce anxiety and depression. And um, anxiety and depression can also, and pain signaling can are common contributors to poor quality of sleep. However, some antidepressants may cause sleep disturbances while others help treat insomnia. So if you do experience sleep difficulties while on antidepressant medication, it's definitely have a chat with your doctor or specialist or whoever um, recommended that medication to you to dis um, discuss potential impacts of it and these symptoms that you're having. So understanding these effects is crucial for effectively managing both pain and sleep quality. Some evidence suggests while sleep medication can help induce sedative effects, it's only recommended for the short term and can have long-term effects in pain and increase pain perception. So insomnia, a common sleep disorder, can also be linked to various factors, including chronic pain and also medication side effects. So some medications such as the beta blockers here 
Um, they are used for high blood pressure and heart rhythm problems. And they actually might interfere with sleep by causing nightmares, vivid dreams, or reducing your melatonin production. And then other medications like baroxine, sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Um, so this is commonly used to treat hypothyroidism can cause insomnia if not properly adjusted to the right dose and it can lead to hyperactivity, nervousness and difficulty sleeping. So if you experience some of those side effects, have a chat to your doctor and it might just mean um, looking at the dosage of it. So um, our corticosteroid injections, so they're commonly used for arthritis patients but they may also disrupt sleep by suppressing our melatonin production and mimicking cortisol. So these can activate parts of our endocrine system that promotes um, wakefulness and actually disrupt the circadian rhythm and sleep cycle as well. But if you um, also have a, if you're on any of these medications and you're having um, uh, your sleep quality is affected, have a chat to your doctor or specialist about it and they sh should be able to give you more information on how to um, fix it. All right, sleep hygiene. So sleep hygiene invol involves cultivating good sleeping habits by addressing lifestyle factors, environmental conditions and behaviours throughout the day. Several studies have found that good quality sleep may improve chronic pain. So there was a study done in 2016, which looked at adults and children who had chronic pain conditions, and um, they found that they slept poorly and actually had a lot more intense pain and greater levels of disability. So we all know when we haven't slept well, we're tired, we're cranky, everything hurts hurts and we become that more hypersensitive to the pain going on in our body so there are many things you can do to improve your sleep and we're going to go into we're going to go in the next few slides we're going to talk about some sleep hygiene tips so the first one is to maintain a regular sleep schedule by going to bed and waking up at the same time each day and that's even said on weekends and when traveling. Um, first one, the next one is to avoid napping in the late afternoon or evening as it can interfere with your nighttime sleep pattern. And also remember it can, um, your sleep pressure, if you nap, it can make it start again. So it might, that delay on, on sleep when you fall asleep may be impacted as well. Establish a bedtime routine to relax before bed, such as reading, listening to soothing music or taking a warm bath and then minimising the screen time in the bedroom so the blue light that is emitted from your electronic devices can disrupt your sleep. Um, and, but if you're on it and you've turned off that blue light and you have like that yellow light, try and avoid the alarming or unsettling content before bed as well because that obviously can you know, set you up to focus on that and not go into your sleep, you know, it affects the time that you take to, take to fall asleep. Also, keep the bedroom environment comfortable with that moderate temperature and minimal noise. Use low lighting in the evening to signal to your body that it's time to wind down, which helps produce your melatonin as well. Exercise regularly, but avoid, you know, hard exercise. So that vigorous exercise late at night, as it may keep you awake and feeling alert. And then choose to have a smaller dinner meal or not have as a huge meal at nighttime um, because that can disrupt sleep as well because your body can, you know, use a bit of energy digesting it and you could be alert from all the you know nutrients micro and macronutrients and it might keep you awake so choose to have like a smaller meal at night time as well limit your caffeine intake in the late afternoon and evening as it can interfere with sleep so for me for example I can't drink coffee after 10 30 a.m so 10 30 in the morning I can't have coffee after that because it affects my ability to fall asleep at night so some people can be really sensitive to caffeine while others can drink 
coffee and tea at night and have no problems at all. So it might be if you're finding you're having like an afternoon coffee and you're having strugg- struggling to get to sleep, it might be worth looking at it and thinking, would this afternoon coffee, the caffeine affect my ability to fall asleep at night? Um, and try have one a bit earlier in the day and see if that can help. And then avoid alcohol before bed as it may disrupt sleep patterns and make it harder to stay asleep. So if you feel comfortable too, um, you can take yourself off mute or put it in a chat box. Um, what helps you sleep better at night? Um, it might be a good idea good way to get some tips from people what they do to help them fall asleep so for me I like to read before bed I also um so I'm reducing the time if the that I'm having on the blue light I'm reading and I do some light stretching as well and all um and that helps I don't know it just helps me feel more relaxed and if I have trouble falling asleep and, you know, I'm overthinking things and my mind's going 100 miles an hour. I also put on some meditation podcasts or I put some nice like ocean sounds on and I tend, as I'm falling asleep, I focus on those sounds rather than what's going on in my head and actually soothes me and puts me, starts, puts me to sleep. Um, if anyone wants to share what they do, help them sleep better at night. If you do anything, if you have any tips or recommendations, feel free to chat, put in the chat box or take yourself off mute. But if not, we'll move on to the next point. Might just give it a little bit. All right, All right move on. So oh, we've got... Someone that added in. Thanks, Karen. You put music on as well and you make lists of things to do so they're not in your head. That's actually such a great point because I know when I was doing my master's degree, I'd have so many things that I had to get done with assignments and research and all that. So I'd actually make a list at nighttime. So I'm like, okay, at least I have, I wake up and I know what's going on for tomorrow. So that's such a good point to put, make a list so they're not in your head. And King, you have a warm cacao drink that's really lovely. It, it can um, that can really help people feel relaxed and fall asleep too. And it's a beautiful drink to have as well. All right. So sleep tips, sleep hygiene tips and recommendations. So um, the first one is to identify whether sleep disturbances are caused by a sleep disorder or factors within your control. So pay attention to your body's natural signals of sleepiness and only sleep when you're genuinely tired and avoid forcing yourself forcing yourself to go to bed or to nap. As we've mentioned before, limit caffeine intake um, later in the day and evening because um, it obviously it has that stimulating effect so it can impact your sleep as well as nicotine and alcohol too. Um, and alcohol can also worsen um, sleep disorders like sleep apnea or insomnia as well. Um, and then maintain a comfortable room temperature between 18 and 22 degrees, and that helps support your body's natural temperature to drop during your sleep. And minimizing the screen time before bed, as we know, all know now that the blue light from our devices can reduce our production of melatonin and cortisol. And these obviously help us with our sleep regulation and then have that consistent bedtime routine to signal to your body that it's time to wind down, prepare for sleep, and it promotes that better sleep quality and energy levels during the day. So sleeping tips and recommendations for pain. So it's important to not go to bed if you are in pain. So um, one of the tips is to take your pain relief medication before bed or use that heat therapy um, if necessary. So whatever you do that helps manage your pain at nighttime. Um, and consider asking your doctor about slower releasing pain relief medication that lasts longer um, 
So you can take at night time and hopefully it can help you during the night feel pain. And then another one is to practice distract, distraction techniques. So like deep breathing or stretching, um, as I've mentioned, you know, reading or journaling or writing your lists. This can help reduce your worry and overstimulation, which can also worsen insomnia and pain. And use pillows for support. So based on the location of um, your arthritis, you can experiment with pillow placement to find the most comfortable position for you. And then um, some people like to try thermal gloves if they've got um, arthritis in their hands, their wrists and their fingers, and it can help reduce swelling and provide that gentle compression. And that signals to our brain with that compression that, you know, it feels safe, our joints feel safe. So some people find that it can be really soothing and help with their pain. And that's especially seen, you know, in the hands and fingers and stuff. Um, and also have a chat to your doctor about sleeping medications or melatonin supplements. Um, but it's really important to avoid relying on them excessively because um, you don't want to become dependent on them. And it does actually disrupt our natural sleep patterns. So it's important to address the, uh, the root causes of your poor sleep and your reduced sleep quality and pain rather than just solely relying on medications alone. So try and aim for natural and sustainable sleep solutions. And then some people like to use a um, sleep diary. So they find it can help with your sleep pattern and monitoring your sleep habits. And then this can be used, taken to your doctor or specialist, or if you see sleep specialist as well, to discuss your findings. So the Sleep, sleep Australia Diary is a great resource to explore for those looking at a better understanding of your sleep patterns. And then it will also help make informed decisions about improving your sleep quality. And then some more information. These are some great um, organizations to reach out to if you're having um, for more information on sleep and they specifically focus on sleep quality. So the first one, the Sleep Foundation, they have a range of trusted health information. Um, they've also got expert tested sleep products. So you can have a chat to them about um, products to help sleep. Um, they've also got educational videos and tailored sleep routines and then obviously the latest of sleep news. So you can visit their website there or call them. They've got a free info line number, which is 1833 I can't sleep or they have a direct office number, which is that one there. And then you've got the Sleep Health Foundation. So that's a non-for-profit um, charity. And it aims to raise community awareness about the value of sleep and how to improve it and address common sleep disorders. So they actually have a, an extensive range of health and sleep information resources on their website. So you can check them out there. They're an Australian company. And then you've got This Way Up. And this is a great organisation that ex has experienced mental health professionals that are passionate about transforming the effective psychological therapy into practical online tools to help manage your mental well-being. So they actually have an online program for insomnia and it can be really beneficial for people to do. So it's self-paced, it's online, and I guess it helps you understand more about insomnia and ways to overcome it. And then finally, there is ResMed. So they have an online sleep assessment tool and a home sleep test that is Medicare rebate, uh, rebated. So have a chat with your doctor about your eligibility or you can visit their website or give them a call. They're an Australian company as well for more information. And then finally, a summary of today's webinar. Sorry, it's been a lot of information um, thrown at you today, but as we age, our circadian rhythm, so our internal body clock, regulates our sleep-wake cycle and it tends to change. So this can affect our sleep patterns, making it harder to get the rest we need. 
And it's not just about how much sleep we get, though it's about the quality of that sleep um, is really quite more important. So getting that good quality, deep sleep is really, really important for that feeling of being restored and refreshed and it can help with our pain perception as well. So there's a strong connection between sleep, inflammation and pain. And when we don't get enough good quality sleep, it can, as I mentioned, can increase our perception of pain, which can make us feel worse overall. And it's that vicious cycle. Poor sleep leads to more pain and more pain makes it harder to sleep. But the good news is that there's plenty of tips and tricks out there to help improve your sleep. So from maintaining a consistent sleep schedule to creating a relaxing bedtime routine, these small changes can make a big difference in how well you sleep and in turn, how well you manage your pain and inflammation. And that is it. I'm just going to turn off the recording. Um, stop recording.